We're here to talk about uh, Android testing uh, and explain how uh, at Shazam we are forming our uh, testing strategy for the Android client. Uh, my name is Yordanis Ganakakis and I'm the Android team lead. You can follow me uh, on Twitter. And my name is Savas, I'm a senior engineer, We're also working on the Android team. Um, so this is going to be almost like an extension to Philip's uh, lab uh, session in the morning. Uh, where he explained about uh, quite a lot of uh, around uh, Android build systems and testing. So we're going to explain how we have been doing things such as ZAM and why we took some of the decisions um, and how our strategy works and what we've gained from it. Um, the awkward moment when I have to explain what Shazam is doesn't happen very often, but just in case. Uh, Shazam is a service that uh, helps you recognize audio. Uh, it has been around for about 12 years. Most people don't understand that don't realize that. Um, initially it was a phone service, so you just call a number and then you would get a text back about what, what, was, what song was playing. Since then things have evolved quite a lot, so we have uh, mobile clients uh, on iOS and Android of course, uh, which help you do exactly the same thing but a lot faster. Um, so when we are talking about 100 million users in the title, uh, I'd have to explain a bit more of that. Uh, what we mean is that if you go to the Play Store right now, you will see that uh, the installation base for our app currently is 100 million users. Uh, of course, not all of them are going to be equally active. Uh, some of them are not. But this gives you a slight indication about the order of magnitude of our user base. So the question about what can make users happy is an open-ended one. There's no clear answer to that. Uh, what we, the scope for this talk at least, is going to be how we can add more and more features and enable, that enable users to do things that they couldn't do before. Um, so, the, uh, what as developers, when, uh, of course, when we're developing something that's going to end up at 100 million uh, devices, we have great responsibility to make sure that everything works everywhere. Um, and the question, the other important point is how do we make sure that apart from just shipping the new features, how do we make sure that we haven't broke any of the existing functionality? And the last question is how do we make sure that developers are not stressed by that? How, how do we make sure that developers are as productive and can keep working at the same pace? Uh, we do this obviously, as the title suggests, uh, uh, with testing. Now this is DevOps. Many of you will already be familiar with the subject, but there's a lot of people out there and a lot of Android uh, developers specifically because the subject has only been really addressed in the, cup in the past uh, two years or so, so not a lot of people are really familiar with it. Uh, the way we see testing is a way to uh, remove the burden and the stress uh, out of the development process so that the developer can focus on the things, on the task at hand. Uh, of course, a lot of Android people as I said, uh, in the past couple of years, we've been uh, uh, testing on Android has, has uh, gained a lot of traction. And a lot of Android people think that this is something that they would like to, to try, but they're not really sure how, or they think they don't have the time to. Uh, uh, we, we would like to show you how we uh, think that uh, testing has uh, increased our productivity, um, has uh, allowed us to write better code, and overall has made our lives much easier. So ever since we uh, adopted testing as our de facto uh, uh, programming practice, uh, we've uh, seen that we have increased our release cycle. Uh, we, we now release every uh, four weeks, um, uh, where before that we, our re releases were completely erratic. It could have taken up to uh, six weeks, sometimes a month, uh, a couple of months. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so with the, with the test suite, how, how has that improved our uh, uh, release cycle? Having a test suite that you can rely on and make sure that you're not breaking functionality has allowed us to focus on implementing new features. So every time that we have a new release coming up, we just have to focus on the couple, uh, maybe f uh, f uh, two, three features that we have to deliver uh, without worrying that we've broken, uh, broken anything uh, that we've built before. Uh, using that, we're actually uh, able to release even uh, faster than a couple of weeks. But we found out that if you release too often, uh, Android users become a bit upset for some reason. Uh, you would think that updates are a good thing, but people, people complain when you update too, too often. So we found that four weeks is a sweet spot for releasing. Every, uh, if you deliver features to your user every month, they're happy and uh, we're happy as well. Um, and our release uh, process is actually quite uneventful now. We, we have a, basically a button that you press and uh, that builds uh, the app that we're ready to release. Uh, continuous integration and automating our build process has helped a lot uh, as well in this process. 
Testing improves your code base. Like we've seen this many times,、uh, it allows you to improve your code base. We've, seen, we've done this in the past.、Uh, if you have an automated test suite that guarantees that the features that you've written behave the same way, you are、uh, free to completely change parts of your、uh, app without having to worry about breaking things.、Uh, we've done this with our networking layer and our persistence layer very recently, where we completely changed everything. And、uh, we, we, had the, we had the confidence that we,、uh, we were able to release and not break anything. Uh, also, uh, testing produces better code.、Uh, we've managed, as you can see from this graph, which we got from Sonar,、uh, we, we, we constantly monitor our code. You see that we've、uh, massively decreased,、uh, duplication,、uh, duplicate, sorry, yes, decreased critical violations. Uh, <laughs> yes, and、uh, duplicated lines、uh, when we increased test coverage. And you can easily see in this graph at which point did we uh, adopt uh, uh, testing. Hint, it's this thing here.、Um, Yes, so it produces better code and allows you to change code、uh, with confidence.、Uh, testing is actually cheaper、uh, than non testing.、Uh, you can see this、uh, graph from a、uh, test droid、uh, that shows the, the cost of testing manually versus uh, testing uh, with an automation system. You see that initially the cost of automation is higher because you, know, you have to train people if they're not familiar with it. You also have to set up your environment in such a way that allows you to test. But over time, these two lines converge, and then the, testing,、uh, the manual testing line、like, shoots completely out of the, the, the graph. Whereas the, the automated one slightly increases, but not massively. And you, know, you can throw more machines at automated testing, but getting more people every time you double your uh, uh, test suite is not really a viable solution.、Um, uh, this affects、uh, small and big companies alike. Like in a big company, you have An explosion of a number of features over time.、Uh, and having to worry about older、uh, features that you have to make sure you haven't broken can be completely detrimental to your productivity. So, not having to worry about that is, is, is a great、uh, gain. But at the same time, it benefits、uh, small teams or smaller companies because, of course, you have the same benefit, but you can also avoid the cost of、uh, having to hire manual QA testers. And that can be a really expensive thing、uh, for a, a small startup.、Um, Also, we strive to, to make our tests really easy to write because people, like, we find that the barrier that most people hit when they try to do testing for the first time is that they think it's difficult to do and understand. And I think partly the reason for that is that many of the, the, the way that people have、uh, either demonstrated how to do testing or the, the open source projects that do have testing、uh, in them, they produce unreadable and unmaintainable te test code, and people get scared uh, 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 when they see that. And if your first interaction with something scares you, you're not really willing to invest time in doing it. So if you keep your test simple,、uh, such as this test, this is a completely unrelated test, obviously, but it's a very simple test, and it tests one thing very efficiently. If you can't see the color number in the bubbles, you, you suffer from, from some sort of、uh, color blindness. So we, we strive with our tests to make them like this easy to read. Uh, very focused, test one thing. And、uh, we found that when, people,、uh, when writing tests is、uh, easy, people will do it. I can see some people double checking whether they're actually calling it right. <laughs>、uh, so let's consider a realistic uh, example. Uh, this is not a real feature, but it could be.、Uh, let's say that a product owner approaches us and、uh, he comes up with the idea about checking in a discovery,、uh, the, the venue where it was discovered. Uh, so, for this example, we consider the Lexington, which is a bar I like. And uh, I uh, figured out that the song was playing was、uh, Last for Life. Uh, then uh, the app would、uh, prompt the user to be able to check in this discovery if they wish. And that's going to be our first very simple uh, feature. Uh, later on, we, we can extend this with charts for this particular venue or discovering venues nearby that play similar music. So I think that's going to be a very interesting feature.、Um, you might be、uh, familiar with this.、Uh, I'm going to explain very quickly about TDD and BDD.、Uh, of course,、uh, Ken Beck、uh, is a very well known practitioner for TDD,、uh, introduced this concept in around 2003.、Uh, we write tests first. And we go through the red green refactor cycle.、Uh, when you actually first try the tests, none of the code exists to implement that feature. So we see the tests failing, failing for the right reason, getting the right diagnostics. Then we implement the feature.、Uh, the tests are happy,、uh, so they are green. And then the important step that some developers miss 
refactoring the code to make it look nice and make it more extensible for the future. Uh, Dan North was giving the keynote yesterday, and we're pretty honored to be talking at the same talk. Uh, introduced the concept of the left cycle, which is the BDD cycle. Uh, BDD is a concept that different key, key stakeholders of, of a project gather around and they talk about what the behavior of a system should be, so on a much higher level uh, than code. Uh, so then you can speak to your product owners and your QA uh, and the f other developers, and you all know what you're talking about. So to do something like that, you need to describe on a very high level, uh, which in our case, let's consider it's just a UI that I just showed before. Um, and we agree that that's what the feature looks like. So we write the high level tests. Uh, they are read, of course, because the feature has not been implemented. Then we go ahead, do the TDD cycle many, many times. Then finally, green arrow, everything has been done and we can ship this code. Uh, of course, these two cycles are very different in uh, relative complexity. Uh, the cycle on the left-hand side represents something that you would probably run or write maybe once a day or once a week, depending on how complex the feature is and the story points, if you're doing Agile and Scrum. And on the other hand, the uh, cycle on the right will represent something that you probably run tens or even hundreds time, times per day. Uh, tests written on the left-hand side are much slower than the tests on the right-hand side. So you may have seen recent debates about whether or not TDD is helpful, whether actually teams are more productive, whether it leads or not to better design. Um, I think my favorite take on the whole subject is that actually it's not the right question. It doesn't matter. Uh, different teams behave uh, differently in different environments, so it really depends on the context of the team and the feature that you're trying to build whether TDD is the right approach. The reason why, however, we, most of the teams uh, in Achazam do TDD is because it's actually, we find it a lot faster and easier to do that. Uh, the reason why TDD exists in the first place was it actually helped people to write tests without having to retrofit their production code to make it testable. So it's testable by design. Um, another important uh, issue that we solve with this approach uh, is that we resolve external to our team dependencies. So if any, anyone here has written any uh, client-side applications, most of the time that will depend on the server at some point in the lifetime. Uh, so one thing that we can do with that is we agree with uh, the server team. Some of them are sitting back there. <laughs> uh, we agree what the API looks like, what the interface will be. We agree on what the JSON responses are like. So we can start producing internally on the Android uh, testing framework GAND responses of, uh, of, of those endpoints. Uh, another dependency, another example of a dependency is the design. So you don't need to wait for the pixel perfect designs to be able to start writing an app. And our testing framework does exactly that. Um, Finally, it's easily repeatable. So when you are going to describe an issue to someone, to a QA or uh, another developer, you have already written a script that uh, may be hitting an issue. Uh, so there's l less error proneness. So uh, this presentation is also uh, test driven. So we'll begin by showing you how we would take that uh, uh, example that Jordan talked about before and how we would go about uh, writing the acceptances for it. Uh, now, there are many ways, there are many libraries that you can uh, uh, use to uh, do this, but before that, we're going to talk about uh, the BDD steps. Uh, now, uh, uh, this is a very uh, common pattern. I think it's the most widely accepted one now. Uh, the, you split your uh, behavior in three uh, big seg segments. Uh, the given uh, segment, the wed, and the, and the then. On the given step, uh, you arrange your system. This is where you do things like, um, if I'm bringing this on Android, you, you might say that a device has Wi-Fi turned off. Uh, this is you arrange your system in order to uh, perform some actions on it. And you perform those actions on the when step. Uh, on Android, this might be something like interacting with the interface, clicking buttons, or doing stuff like that. And lastly, it's the then step, where you assert that uh, that action that you performed had the desired outcome. Uh, on Android, again, you might assert that an error message was displayed on screen. Now, as I mentioned before, there are many libraries that allow you to uh, take that, uh, once you define this step, and uh, execute it. Uh, how would that step look like? And who defines this step? 
Uh, now, this is done with the business. You might have your product owners or your QA team defining uh, this step like this. You would have a phrase, basically, written in English, where you would say, given a user is near a music venue, and the server always returns a known result. When the user shazams, then the user can check in their discovery. Right? This describes very, very uh, easily what this feature is about, and anyone uh, in the entire uh, company can understand what this step is supposed to do. How do we implement this? Well, we've decided not to use those libraries that I mentioned before, uh, such as Cucumber and uh, JBehave, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. First, we felt that it introduced an unnecessary level of complexity into our system. The way they work is you write this in a normal text file, in a feature file, as they're called, and then you have a piece of code that basically takes that and maps, them, maps that into methods in your code base that execute these steps. We felt that that was a bit unnecessary. And also at the time, uh, even though that has been resolved since then, uh, those uh, well-known libraries wasn't, uh, weren't really compatible with Android because we have some uh, very peculiar runtime uh, run uh, on Android. But uh, yes, so we've, we've came up with our own solution. So what we did is uh, we decided to write that in Java. So what we came up with is something that we called Gwen. Gwen is a very small library. One wouldn't even call it a library, really. It's just some six, six classes. What Gwen does is uh, encourage you to write a domain-specific language that describes your app. Um, and the way to do that is by using um, classes that we call actors or agents. Uh, in this test, uh, user uh, and the server, these are agents of our system. And they have methods on them, uh, is near, returns, systems can check in, that describe what the behavior of the system is or of that actor. Um, and they also take uh, stuff like you know, the Lexington or the Last for Life. Now, the benefit of that is that you're dealing with data directly here when you write this. And, and, uh, one problem with those libraries is that the data mapping. So if you have a complex uh, data structure, you have to define it in a step and then sort of somehow map that into an actual Java class. Here, you can just use the class directly and just give it a, a, a name that you can understand. And this is exactly how our test would look like. If you opened our test suite, you would see exactly this in one of our methods. Um, the other good thing about this is that this is near method, for instance. That hides an implementation under it. So we're still using the normal uh, instrumentation tools that Android provides, but we hide that implementation under these methods. And they describe behavior. The way this behavior is implemented is, is relevant to the test. You can change this completely, and the test wouldn't know, but it would get executed slightly differently. And uh, uh, another benefit, which is sort of related to this, is that you can use the same test and at runtime inject different implementations of these behaviors depending on the, on the configuration of your device. So we have a lot of tests that, run, that are described the same way, but they run completely differently on a tablet than on a phone. If the behavior is the same, you shouldn't have to write the same thing twice, but you might need to take different steps to achieve the same behavior depending on your configuration. Uh, another and the last benefit that we, uh, we see, which is really important, is yes, as I said, we, you build a dictionary of your behavior of your app. By opening these uh, classes, the user, the server, you can see immediately everything that your app can do so far or everything that has been tested in your app. And of course, it allows uh, reusability. A, a, a developer writing a new, uh, a new feature can reuse all these steps. And because this is Java, it's very simple. Uh, well, the moment you write given user dot, you immediately get an option of all the steps that the user can do to arrange the system. So this is very versatile and really useful. Uh, the technologies we use to run our tests is, as I said, we run the default uh, Android instrumentation. Um, there's no need to reinvent uh, the wheel. Because of that, we have to use JUnit 3, unfortunately, because these tests run on the device, and Android doesn't support JUnit 4. Uh, we use Robotium to instrument the device. Uh, we find it very, uh, very, it's a very mature system by now. It's very uh, uh, well known and used by many. This is the bit that w was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting feedback, is that, okay. It's a bit weird. okay. Uh, yes, we're using Robotium, as I said, and this is uh, hidden underneath the, implement uh, the uh, description of that step. Uh, recently, we started uh, experimenting with Espresso, uh, which is a, a newer library. Many people here, I'm pretty sure, are familiar with it. The beauty of this is that we can replace, start replacing steps in our code base um, without the test suite changing at all. So that is near Lexington uh, step, or the user Shazams. We can decide to implement that using Espresso. All we have to do is change the implementation underneath the, the hood. All the tests remain the same, and they just execute differently now. Obviously, we use Gwen. 
And lastly, we use uh, what we call hammock server. This is our own um, uh, sort of wrapper around the uh, Google uh, mock, uh, mock web server, uh, which uh, introduces a Hamcrest-like uh, syntax that allows us to very easily define uh, uh, responses based on uh, requests that come to a server. So um, I showed you the diagram before, and I may have cheated a bit because I hit those two blue arrows. Uh, what I'm going to go ahead and explain what those are. Uh, explaining what parts of the system we're not testing. So if you, you don't need to read the diagram on the right hand side, but it's actually a very complicated diagram about what the callbacks of the systems are to your, to your application, depending on the different states of uh, activities. Uh, by the way, anyone here has written any Android applications? Or That's about one fifth. Uh, so activities and fragments are the components that Android uh, exposes for, to developers if someone wants to write a UI-based application. Your, your application doesn't necessarily have to be UI, but most of the times it is. Uh, if you can check the shape of the diagram, you can see that it's actually very complicated and it actually interacts quite a lot. Activities and fragments interact quite a lot and not always predictably. Uh, so if you wanted to, in, to use that to write unit tests for your application, you can understand that the complexity is uh, compounding, so you don't want to necessarily mess with Android when you're writing, when you're testing your, your own code. And we'll see how, in, in a second, how we can separate that. Another thing we don't test is uh, custom views, animations. And most of the, the, the biggest reason why we don't is that it's just not easy. Uh, you can't really write a test that tests that an animation is smooth. There's no way to do that, at least as far as I don't know anyone. <laughs> um, of course, these parts will require some manual testing. You will need some human eyeballs on these uh, features, uh, and there's no way around that. Uh, most of the time, you may see some uh, uh, junkiness, animation junkiness. You're just going to go back to your uh, tools, your profilers, and try to iron out any performance issues. What we insist in doing, though, is actually try to test things that are actually lending themselves better to testing. Uh, so we are going to see how we separate the presentation logic. Uh, so we are writing UI applications, and we want to see how uh, when things come on screen and off screen, and we want to test the logic behind it, so we try to separate the logic. Uh, on the other hand, there's the business logic. Uh, of course, every application will, at some point, have some domain uh, business specific logic. And of course, this lends itself very well to being unit tested uh, with uh, good old ways of doing it. And that's about it. We are not trying to use any uh, of some libraries like RoboElectric to test the combination of the two, so the life cycle of Android and your application. Because most of the time, that, that gets way too complicated. It's not a very maintainable way to do things. Uh, and it's just not worth it in the end. So let's see how we do that. So the way we separate uh, these bits is using the well-known MVP pattern. Now, there are many patterns that you can use to separate your business logic uh, from your presentation, but we found that on Android, the, the easiest to work with is the MVP. Uh, just a very brief overview uh, for those that you, you don't know. Uh, the, under the MVP pattern, you, you split your app in three uh, sections, uh, the model, uh, where your business logic uh, lies. This is a, a pure... Uh, in our case, Java code, uh, that doesn't know uh, the specifics of your platform. This should be easily transferable. Uh, if, you, if you had written a, a piece of code that lives in your model, you should think about the ability to move that into a different platform. If you can't do that, there's, uh, it probably doesn't belong there. Uh, the view, this is your uh, platform-specific code. In our case, it's the activities and fragments that uh, Jordan described. And uh, this is basically the, uh, what the user would see. In our case, on a website, it would be the... Uh, uh, the web the interface, uh, and uh, this shouldn't contain any complicated logic in it. Actually, the the, uh, it shouldn't contain any logic, if you can uh, make it so. And this is where the presenter comes in. The presenter is supposed to coordinate these two uh, bits, the view and the model. Uh, it should uh, react to events from the view. It should then use the model to perform tasks, and then uh, take data from the model and present them back to the view. Uh, on Android, uh, we have the, uh, the system uh, there on the right that basically uh, drives our app. And it drives our app using the uh, callbacks uh, on start, on stop, on resume, on pause, all these uh, uh, callbacks that uh, we saw in that diagram before. 
Uh, these get forwarded into our view, which is our activities or our fragments. The view then talks to the presenter, forwarding these events to it. The presenter then talks to the model, as I described before, gets data back, and then presents them to the view. Um, the way, uh, what, what this allows us to do is uh, uh, test two-thirds of, uh, of our system. So our presentation and our uh, business logic can now be unit tested using uh, Java. We don't have to mess around with Android. Uh, it, it makes things very easy. Um, yes, as I mentioned, we don't need to test the Android bit because it's just the binding of uh, the data to the view. Um, the view is very dumb. It has no, uh, no if statements, nothing in it. And uh, that way we avoid these dependencies that uh, cause a lot of problems uh, on Android. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll show uh, in a bit exactly how we do this. Um, we rely on acceptance tests to cover the view. Um, so if you forget to bind something on a view, there will be an acceptance test that will, that will catch that. A key part of that is uh, dependency injection. Again, I'm pretty sure many of you know what this is. Just a very quick uh, overview. Uh, dependency injection, uh, many people uh, link them, uh, like they, they think of a DI framework when they think this, like Spring or something. But in its purest form, it's basically a way to break dependencies between components. So instead of creating hard-coded dependencies, uh, dependencies in a class, a class gets given uh, a dependency through an interface. That allows a separation of behavior versus the implementation. So a class would use, an implementation of, uh, an, uh, would use the implementation of an interface without actually knowing what implementation that is. And that also allows us to swap uh, uh, between tests uh, and production code uh, implementation of that interface, which allows us to use test doubles. Uh, so uh, let's say if we have a client and they need a feature, uh, in our case, that would be a venue retriever. Um, there can be two ways to, a couple of ways, uh, to uh, retrieve a venue. One would be to hit the network through an HTTP call, uh, get the results and present them. Or the other one would be to hit a local cache uh, database uh, or an in-memory cache. Now, the client doesn't need to know how a venue is retrieved. It needs to know what to do when it retrieves a venue. So injecting uh, an implementation, uh, in injecting an implementation separates that uh, hard-coded dependency. Um, now, the way we do this is using a third-party component called the injector. The injector knows all the various implementations of an interface and supplies them to the client at runtime. Uh, and as, as, as I mentioned before, the client, the client only is aware of the interface. Now, how would that look in the example that we, uh, uh, we talked about before? Our model defines the interface, which, as we said, is a venue retriever. Uh, uh, there's a method on it it's called find closest venue, and it pr you can provide a callback uh, which you get notified when a venue is retrieved. The first implementation of that would be a network venue retriever in which we would do some sort of slow networking calls, hit an API, uh, of course error handling and all that stuff, but to keep things simple, yes, you, you get a, a venue from the network and then you notify the callback. Another implementation would be the local venue retriever in which we do a database lookup or we look in the memory cache. Uh, we might even uh, compose this to, to do a network call if the first one doesn't succeed or uh, uh, you know, even more complicated uh, uh, venue retrievers. Uh, our activity is the bit that, as, as, Andro uh, as Jordan mentioned before on Android, that's the bit that displays things for you, if you will, for those that don't know. We inject a venue retriever here using a, a static factory method. Uh, now, in classical DI, you, you, you would inject that dependency in the constructor. Uh, but the reason we don't do this here is because Android controls our uh, code. We don't control it. And you have to provide a constructor without any parameters uh, to it. So we inject it directly to a field. And then in onCreate, which is the first callback that we receive, one of the first callbacks, uh, you know, we, we get the results. Then we construct our presenter, providing ourselves as a view, the activity, uh, the venue retriever that we just injected, and the result to display. And on start is where we, uh, we start the presentation logic. We, we instruct the presenter to start presenting. Now, how does that look? Like, what does this do? The presenter, now this is the first test-driven unit, test-driven class that we, uh, that we write. Um, as you can see, the dependencies are injected in the constructor of this class. This allows us to use test doubles to verify behavior in our tests. And the logic is very simple in the uh, present call. Uh, when uh, we start presenting, we notify the view to show the result that we've loaded. Uh, and at the same time, we use the business logic, the model, to fetch a venue that is close to us. 
And when we retrieve the venue, we notify the view uh, to display uh, a check-in prompt for that venue. Uh, as I said, this is test-driven. At this point, the presenter has no knowledge of Android. Like, uh, there, is, there is no concept of any platform here. You use only these interfaces. Uh, that interface, the view, the view interface, uh, is test-driven uh, when you are writing the presenter. And uh, it, we've, we see here that we have two, two methods on it. Uh, we need to show a result, and we need to show a check-in prompt. And that's, that's all we have to do when implementing this interface. That is implemented again in our activity. Um, now, at this point, the, the activity is supposed to just simply bind these uh, uh, data to uh, some sort of Android view. You might uh, bind them to a button or show the images or the title of the, uh, of the song, of the result that you got. And then when you are uh, supposed to show the check-in prompt, you, you take uh, uh, some steps like that. Because this view is supposed to be very simple, we, uh, we don't have any if statements here. We don't have any, any logic whatsoever. It's simple data binding. And because of that, this, this activity has a cyclomatic complexity of one. There is no need to unit test this. Uh, it doesn't actually do much. It has no business logic. But of course, errors can still be introduced. You might forget to bind things correctly. You might not display the title, for instance. That gets uh, covered by our acceptance test. So we have acceptance tests that cover all the happy path cases. And that, that way, we verify that all these callbacks do what they're supposed to do. Uh, the technologies that we use to do this is JUnit 4 now. We don't have to run on the Android device. We run these tests on the device that we develop on. So we can use JUnit 4. Now, slightly uh, uh, different to what we've talked about before, we do use Roboelectric. Roboelectric, for those of you who don't know, is basically a library that allows you to emulate, well, it duplicates the Android API, and it, they provide their own implementation of uh, the behavior that the, uh, the Android platform does. The reason for that is that when you try to use an Android class on pure Java, you get this dreaded runtime exception. Nothing is implemented. You just get, a, you get given a jar with no implementation, so you can't run things against it. But we do use Roboelectric for uh, data types. So Android provides some data types. We're called intents, bundles. There are many, many uh, other data types there. And we, thought, we felt that introducing a, a, an abstraction between data types was a bit of an overkill. So that's the only reason we use this. When we have to deal with Android data types, we use Roboelectric to allow us to uh, interact with them. We use Hamcrest, which allows us to um, um, write expectations in a very natural language. It also produces very nice uh, diagnostics when things fail. Um, and also JMOC that allows us to uh, mock dependencies and verify that methods have the desired uh, side effects. I think we must be the only team that uses JMOC, so everyone seems to be using Mokita for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about uh, how we can write tests and make them look very readable, maintainable, uh, but we haven't yet talked about how the speed compares to unit tests, the speed of high-level tests, I mean. Uh, also, what happens with diagnostics and what can we see what kind of reports can we see when the tests fail? How can we know where to look at? Um, so I suspect most of us have used some flavor of continuous integration. Uh, Philip's uh, lab earlier was he was showing about how we can use Gradle, Maven, and some of the things that we know from uh, traditional uh, Java, the Java world. Um, I w recently we have migrated to Gradle. Uh, it started providing an Android plugin. Uh, to help you do that. It, it still has its limitations, but we were adventurous and we went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, one of the things that you need to do necessarily is that you need to have instant feedback when you're committing code. Uh, every team knows that. Otherwise, things break and no one looks at what happened and no one fixes that stuff. Um, so that's exactly what we were trying to do as well. Every time uh, we committed code, we wanted to have a test suite big enough that tests uh, that has provides us enough coverage and confidence that we are good to go. Um, we, another part of continuous integration is that we also have uh, internal continuous distribution. So if uh, for the registered colleagues of ours, they can get the latest uh, stable build straight away, about half an hour after we've built it. Uh, so that helps us uh, talk to uh, colleagues and see what they think about the app and uh, interact with it. Uh, we talked about speed of execution, and of course most, uh, most of the people who write uh, tests for mobile know that it's really, really slow. Uh, and that's why some teams avoid doing that and have to resort to other solutions like Roboelectric. 
Um, the problem with the usual uh, tools that you get out there, uh, whether that's uh, the normal test runner uh, or uh, other tools, is that normally they run all the uh, tests of a test suite on every device. Um, so as you can see, imagine we have three tests in this test suite. Everything runs on, on those three devices. So we have a combination of nine test runs in the end. Uh, so there is a tool out there called Spoon, uh, developed by uh, a talented team at Square. Uh, what that does is it provides some really cool uh, reports about test executions. Uh, so whenever any test fails, it shows exactly what passed and what failed. Um, taking that as a star starting point, uh, we developed an, our own test runner called Fork. And that kind of solves the problem that uh, test runners usually have. Uh, instead of running every test on every device, we pull um, tests by some device characteristics. Uh, most of the time, this is going to be uh, about screen size. And we distribute those tests on those devices. So you can see that you know, with this test suite, there's three tests, but only one test run happens on each device. And that's a lot faster. Um, so what that gives us, as I said earlier, you can see an example of, uh, we, by the way, we copied uh, shamelessly the, <laughs> the reports from Spoon. Uh, it's probably the only part of the tool of the code that we didn't touch because it's already good enough. Uh, but what that gives us is that it's a lot, lot faster. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to plug many more devices. Uh, and of course, because uh, we plug in more devices and we split the test runs, it's actually a lot faster. Um, at the moment, with the current setup, we have something like one uh, test completed every two seconds. And if you have ever uh, written any RoboElectric tests, that's very comparable uh, speed. But actually, it gives you a lot more confidence because it's a test that has actually run on a device, so it's, it, it's a lot better. Um, again, that enabled us to do proper continuous integration. Before that, we would have to resort to only run tests on real devices once per day. And that's not good enough for most cases. It doesn't offer full validation, because we don't have all the tests run everywhere. Uh, but it's good enough for CI. And most of the cases, actually, when things pass on fork, they're more, most, most likely going to pass on the nightly. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes uh, you have to, that's the best way we have right now. Uh, to catch any errors like that, we use Spoon on, on a nightly basis. So we, for continuous integration, we use fork and then nightly uh, use Spoon. By the way, this is a tool that's going to be open sourced very soon. It's not out there yet. Uh, we, uh, we did the mistake of adding some internal dependencies, which were at the process of actually clearing up right now. It's almost like 80% complete, so it's going to be ready uh, without giving any timelines. Nice. Soon. <laughs> soon. But you know, as with any mobile uh, software development, many of you will know this, uh, problems will occur, and problems that are not specifically uh, bugs. Uh, devices are flaky by nature. They might lose connection. And they might completely freeze for, for completely unrelated reasons. So we need to address these things. Uh, and we need to keep a track of how, uh, what uh, test failed on what device. So we, we created this tool. Uh, I'm not sure if we're open sourcing this or not, but it's a bit harder because it depends on Jenkins and our plans, so it's a bit harder. Okay. Yeah. What this tool does is basically <laughs> give you an overview of uh, uh, the tests and all the devices that these, these tests run on. Every column on this uh, graph is uh, representing a device, and every row represents a test that run on this device. And as you can see, for every uh, intersection of these, you get a list, a historical list of every test execution on that, of that test execution on that device. Uh, you get some green, some yellows. Red <coughs> is a failure. And as you can see on that graph, that middle device, there's something wrong with it. We have to fix it. For some reason, all the tests that are displayed in the screen have failed in the past week or something uh, on that device. So we have to address this. There's something wrong with it. Um, uh, so one second to yeah. say that actually you don't only need devices. You can use emulators, and it will still run exactly the same way. And fork is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Just to so how do we fix these problems? Well, one way is to go to the device and see what's wrong with it. But uh, depending on the configuration of your team, like in our case, all our tests, devices, are in a completely separate room under lock and key. We have access to them, but you know, we have to walk every time something go, uh, goes wrong, and it's not very easy. 
Uh, we also have team members that are uh, located, uh, located remotely. We have uh, team members in uh, San Francisco, and they need to also be able to do this. So what we've developed is uh, one of our team members actually developed a, t a tool called ADB Remote. You can find that on GitHub. What this does is you run this on the same uh, box as you have your devices uh, connected to, and it uh, creates a, a server. You can log in, and you get this nice web interface that allows you to remotely interact with the device. This is an interactive view. You can click things, you can type things in, you can issue ADB commands, you can reboot the device, you can do whatever you want with it. And this allows you to quickly uh, fix problems such as, oh, the network went down, so I can navigate to the Wi-Fi settings and turn network on. Uh, uh, and yes, as I said, this works through the web, so we have our team members in California being able to actually interact with the devices that we have plugged in in London. So that's really, uh, really useful. Uh, but, of course, you know, uh, we can test so many things. Machines are really good at testing and verifying expected behavior. Uh, there are many things that you cannot uh, find. A machine cannot discover bugs for you. Uh, now, we do our best, of course, to, uh, when we develop these features, to think of any, every edge case that we can uh, possibly imagine, to try and make it really stable. But a developer, as many of you uh, know, suffers from uh, some sort of blind spot. When, when you're writing your code, you're not interacting with it as a user would. So for that, we have an excellent team of manual QA testers. Uh, their sole job is to break our app. So uh, every time we release a feature, they, they test it rigorously. They try to break it. They, uh, they have a, a large uh, variety of devices, actually uh, more devices than we have in our automated test suite, and they try to, to see how, uh, if that feature works across all, uh, all the devices out there that, that we have. Um, uh, they also uh, deal with things that, uh, as Jordan mentioned before, we cannot automate. Uh, such as, is the UI smooth? Uh, do, do the animations work? Uh, for that, you need a human person. And, a human person. <laughs> you need a person to verify that things uh, look okay. Uh, but the QA process doesn't end there. Once we release, we constantly monitor the performance of our app using various metrics and uh, statistics. Uh, so whenever we release a version, we, we monitor it constantly to see if there's something wrong. So if we, for some uh, reason, introduce a bug that uh, cause the average uh, tag time to increase by a second, we know that almost an hour after we released, once we've gathered enough data, and we can address it at that point. We can decide to either do a point release um, or, you know, depending on uh, what the problem might be. Um, the last uh, uh, bit of this puzzle is um, cross-reporting. Uh, we use HockeyApp uh, uh, to do cross-reporting as well as distribute our app internally. There are many tools out there you can use. There are many open source free tools that you can use. Uh, what this does, it complements our uh, monitoring. So uh, we have about 6,000 uh, Android devices out there. It's, 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 it's crazy. You can't have all these devices uh, in-house. So we, we take a representative sample of what we think uh, should uh, cover all the bases. And then we just, complete, uh, we just keep monitoring uh, the app uh, as it is live. So when, uh, uh, when our app crashes, let's say, on a specific uh, brand of a device, we know, we know this immediately, and we can, as I said before, address it by doing a point release or deciding whether we want to wait for, another, uh, for our next release cycle. Uh, yeah, that's it. So just to recap uh, what we have seen today uh, is that, first of all, when we started doing TDD on Android, we thought it was going to be almost impossible. Uh, and at the beginning, it was uh, because the tool set is slightly limited. There are tools out there that can help you like, as a starting point. Uh, hopefully, we're bridging some of that gap ourselves uh, and then share back uh, with the community. Uh, but what has helped us improve is actually practice a lot, and, that has, and we're still learning. We have, it's a continuous learning process, that, and that never finishes. Um, in the end, you know, there's always going to be issues, so you have to take the risk and leap and ship it. Uh, but you have to be careful when you are releasing to 100 million users. Uh, so we have. Also, seven minutes for questions. Yeah. Is your, I take it that you've got a presenter library that's just a standard Java project. Can you build that and just check and see where So that's a good question. The question is uh, whether we actually have separated our presenter uh, code so much that we can export the library. Uh, currently, it's a package in the main project, in the Android project. But you're right that, uh, as a principle, we want to separate that completely and actually build it with uh, just pure Java. The only problem is what Savas mentioned earlier, that we actually use still, you may find intents in there, 
sometimes. Uh, so that's the only reason why we haven't completely separated yet, but that's the plan. And that's actually a good uh, thought experiment about whether something should be uh, in the presenter. If it's pure Java, it means that it's most likely uh, belong there, belongs there. What's your kind of team structure? Is QA completely separate from development, or is it integrated? Or um, they're very integrated. So I have a QA person sitting next to me and just opposite me. <laughs> uh, so we actually talk to them a lot, uh, and we hope they break the app uh, a lot. Uh, if you're talking about writing tests, so tests, uh, automated tests are responsibility of developers. Uh, the QA team only does the, the manual stuff that we described, so try, trying to see whether animations are um, smooth. And the other problem we have, of course, is that we are uh, shipping the app for way too many markets and in way too many configurations. And of course, you can't automate all of that. We, you can automate happy path and sometimes some error cases, but of course, you, you know, if you have the, the golden rule is to have something like 5 to 10% of your tests should be automated uh, as in end-to-end, -end, high level, and you can uh, include all of the error cases. So. But to, to that point, to add that, yeah, we're not defining uh, uh, the, the, the tests that we're writing, of course. We have our product uh, owner uh, with our QA and us. We define these uh, features together. Uh, we just simply write them. Uh, we, we, we write them in our execution environment. So. Sure. So the answer to that is, because uh, I've also done some, some time at the server team, that's where we're using jbehave uh, for exactly the same theory, uh, that everyone will be able to define together those textual files with natural language. Uh, but the case is that no uh, product owner, at least I've met, has ever gone through these files. And so, <laughs> yeah. So um, normally what we do is when we uh, receive, uh, let's say, a request that will contain the given one then in natural language, and then we kind of encode it in the Gwen library that we that we have written. Plus, it helps a lot to not have another abstraction layer between the feature files and the real code. It just adds more uh, complexity, and we kind of skip that. And, and but we do have, uh, sorry, so we do have, uh, we use another tool called, called Test Trail. That encodes, uh, that's maintained by the QA team, and that encodes all of the requirements. Uh, so we kind of link uh, our uh, tests to test trail use cases. So when tests pass, we can see it on test trail. Yeah, and to, to add to that, like uh, Jordan mentioned, that he hasn't met any product uh, owner that is willing to write these things. Even if you do find someone uh, and you work in an environment that yeah, business people do want to write these things, you find that people that are not engineers, that are not developers, they tend to describe the same thing differently. So uh, a feature that may, the, uh, a step that they may write today, the same feature will be written completely different by them in a couple of weeks. And all these, uh, all these uh, frameworks like Cucumber and JBehave, they rely on exact phrasing because they rely on pattern matching. So it's, it's not as easy to maintain, we think. And we, we, we just strive to make the tests easy to understand. So if a test fails, someone can actually still read the Java code. It might not be completely textual because you don't have spaces and capitalization and things like that, but we feel that it's a nice compromise. And as, as an additional point, uh, product owners might not be reading the Java files, but QA can. So they, they have GitHub accounts, sorry, GitLab accounts. They can check out the code and actually see what tests look like. So there is... Not everyone may be included, but it's at least good enough so that you know it covers most of the team. Sure. You also mentioned that uh, you're hiding the implementation of certain goals in the library, yeah. certain methods. Um, isn't that a little bit dangerous in terms of the semantics of what that means? Uh, if you train the implementation in near, it means something very different. Sure. So the question is, of course, we've added this, abs this new abstraction called when and uh, code that gets executed underneath. So how do we make sure that uh, a step does the right things? Um, so the, question, the answer to that is uh, the answer that you would give for every test out there. So you have to write your test and see it fail for the right reason. 
and you have to check the diagnostics that produce uh, that they produce. So you have to see that it actually couldn't find a button, and that's a pointer that something was there in the test that was actually trying to click a button. So when you go ahead and implement that, you make sure that th there's no, of course, to answer you your question. Yeah, there's no way to be 100% sure, but I think the best way you can do that is by reading the diagnostics after seeing your test fail first. And I think your question was mostly about uh, if we change the implementation of something, how do we rely, how do we make sure that it's the same thing? Well, A, this is not an inherent problem of Gwen. Any BDD uh, uh, framework that allows you to do this suffer, would suffer from the same problem. Uh, so it's, I guess it's a responsibility of the developer to make sure that it's still the same thing that you're implementing. And also, uh, <laughs> okay, so I think that if you change, if having this ability uh, is more beneficial than risky. So for instance, we have a news feed where we show stories, uh, that, what, what your friends have tagged and stuff like that. And our first implementation had a refresh button. So we had a step that when user refreshes feed, and that went and clicked the button. So we had a lot of tests that were written like that. And then our product owner came in and said, can we do pull to refresh? We were like, yeah, okay, we can do that. So we, just, we had the ability to just go ahead and redefine what that step did. And we didn't have to change any of our tests. It was only one class. Instead of clicking the button, it would try to pull the newsfeed down. All our tests would fail, and then we would go and implement that. So I think that the benefits are better, uh, uh, outweigh the, the problems. I think that's, I think that's exactly 50 minutes. Uh, if you can, let, let's talk uh, right outside, like we're going to be having mm -hmm. lunch soon. So this is exactly 50 minutes. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.